All right, everybody, welcome to Remnant. How are we doing? Woo! My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy weekend to join us and uh, to celebrate what God's doing in the world and in us. And I'm just really glad you're here. I do want to uh, point you to a few announcements. Uh, they're in the bulletin, which you picked up on the way in, I hope. Um, several things coming up that we all need to be aware of, so I'm just going to run through them real quickly. Um, first, next Sunday is our potluck. Feel free to bring your best dish. Bring lots of it. We'll have a great time. That'll be after the service. On Saturday, July 13th, we're planning a work day at church. Um, it's going to be inside because it's too hot to do fun things outside. So feel free to join us. The details are in the bulletin. Uh, 9 a.m. to 11, maybe 2. We'll bring pizza by around noon. Uh, but we need all hands on deck. We've got a lot of cleaning, uh, some painting, some, uh, uh, some paneling to come down, some things that just need to, we need people for. So uh, please put that on your thing. Uh, a Remnant Partners meeting will be on the 21st after the service. If you're not a partner at Remnant, come talk to me about that. Uh, we don't have members here. We have partners. Um, members are more like I paid my dues. Now you owe me. Partners are more like I'm joining you on this mission that God has given you. So we want everybody to be a partner. We'd love for you to do that, but you need to talk to me about that first. That meeting will be on the 21st. Our Hope for Communities Day 4 Hope will be held at uh, our church on August uh, 3rd. That's when all the kids are coming in here. We're going to get them ready to go back to school. It's a big event. Again, all hands on deck. Very busy time at our church right now. Uh, I just encourage you to um, plug in. We're in the eighth week of a series on the tabernacle, and we're going to finish that series today. Uh, and I think we've all learned a whole lot about the tabernacle, but I think more importantly, we've learned a lot more about ourselves and about God. And if you're new today, it may be a little hard to catch up after seven weeks of what we've been talking about. So just, that's okay. There's a lot to learn. And uh, I think God has something for you today. But I just encourage you, keep coming back because we uh, typically uh, have a lot to, to learn together. I want to give some credit today to Ray Vanderlaan. He's an archaeologist, Bible scholar. He's a, a really bright guy, and some of his material helped me think about and, and guide some of what we're going to talk about today. We've been talking about how God got to a point where he told the Israelites, he said, look, I, I'm going to lead you out of slavery. I'm going to lead you into the desert, he would tell them later. I'll be present with you at every step of the way. And he was present with them during their time of training, during their time of testing in the desert. And he made a way for them, a way for them to know he was present with them every day. They could see the fire by night, the cloud by day. God's presence was with them. He was ahead of them. They didn't have a single day where they didn't know that he was there. And he says, build for me a dwelling place. Build for me a portable tent. Build a tabernacle. Build it and I will come live amongst you. So we're finishing our series today about this incredible structure that allowed a holy God to dwell with sinful people. And I think one of the important things to realize is this wasn't just a model for back then. This is a model that should drive the way we interact with God today. How do we approach God as sinful people? God's still holy, we're still sinful. Same process today. When I think of the tabernacle, I think of the incredible intimacy that Moses must have had with God. It started on Mount Sinai. The fire of God fell all around him and God's presence was Moses on top of the mountain. If you remember, at the beginning of this series, I talked about what a challenge it must have been for Moses to have spent 40 days literally in the presence of God, to be there so much that he's literally glowing, and then to have to come back into the world and deal with all the stuff that's in the world. He had to be wondering, how do I take this experience with me? How, how do I keep that fire alive? How do I keep the feelings and the emotions that I had when I was alone with God and now I'm going back into a sinful man's world? I need to keep this fire alive in me and in everybody else. How, how do I do that, God? Well, we've discovered that the answer to Moses' concern was the tabernacle. We noted that God spent 50 chapters in the Bible describing this tabernacle, this tent. 50 chapters. And he only spent two chapters describing the creation of the world. 
This must be an important tent. It was incredibly important to God. Because if we didn't follow it, we wouldn't be able to dwell with him. We would be separated from him. Last week, we actually got to the point where we went into the Holy of Holies and we learned a lot about the Ark of the Covenant. We learned that there's a cloud of incense. You just sang it, let the incense rise. Day and night, day and night, let the incense rise. That incense in the Holy of Holies is the prayers of the people. We're never to stop praying. But that cloud of incense gave a mysterious and spiritual presence to the Holy of Holies. You see, God often appeared in smoke because you couldn't look at him directly. Mount Sinai, smoke everywhere. The altar of incense filled the room with a a wonderful aroma, but also a mysterious essence. The mercy seat and the cherubim were carved out of a single piece of pure gold, just like we saw with the golden lampstand a few weeks ago. And above the mercy seat and between the wings of these angelic beings, God says, that's where I'm going to live. That's where my presence is going to be. You're not going to find it all over the place, although I am all over the place. You're going to find it right there in that place between the two cherubim, above the mercy seat. Now notice this isn't, well, the cherubim is the essence of where God lived, but it's not God. God can't be represented in an image. It's where he dwells. He dwells between the cherubim. And God said to Moses, look, I'll speak to you from that place. When you come into the holiest place, that's where I'll speak to you from. That's where Moses received the Torah, the five books, the first five books of the Bible. How did he know what happened in creation? Literally, God spoke to him between the cherubim. Write this down. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form. That's where it came from, all five books. And we spent most of our seven weeks talking about all the details. Each piece of furniture, the details of the curtain, the metals, the altar, the laver, the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, the altar of incense, the veil, the holy of holies, the box of the covenant, and the mercy seat, all kinds of details. But to close out this series today, I want us to focus on the big picture. Let's close this ark issue, and then I have some overarching themes of the tabernacle that I want to talk about. Let me address one lingering question left over from last week. So where is the Ark of the Covenant? We all saw the movie. Where is it? Well, I have to ask you, which ark are you talking about? The ark in heaven is still in heaven. Never left, never changed. Remember, the entire tabernacle on earth was a replica of the one in heaven. So one answer is obviously the Ark of the Covenant is where it's always been, in heaven. Revelation eleven nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was open, and the Ark of His Covenant was seen within His temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. The Ark is in heaven. Okay, but what about that earthly Ark we talked about? You know, the movie, the archaeologists, is it in the Vatican? Is it in Ethiopia? Buried under the Temple Mount? Is it under a place called Golgotha? Did the Babylonians carry it away? Did they destroy it? Did the Germans have it? I think the prophet Jeremiah knew where the ark was. Many believe he's the one that hid it before the Babylonians came in in 586 B.C. So when did we last see the ark in Scripture? That would be a good place to start, right? When's the last time in the Bible the ark is mentioned? Well, it turns out that we read that the ark on the earth, the last time we hear about it is about 600 years before Jesus was born. 600 years before he's born, we read of the ark of the covenant. The last scriptural reverence is in 2 Chronicles 35, 3. And he said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house that Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel built. That's the temple. You need not carry it on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. In other words, the ark is at its final resting place. It's in the temple. Okay, the problem is it was pretty evident about 585, 90 B.C., that the Babylonians were gonna come through and destroy the temple and everything in it. So many people believe that the prophets and others took the ark and hid it somewhere. 
this passage tells us that the ark was at least still in the Holy of Holies in 622 B.C. Just six years later, Ezekiel is brought in and he notes that God's presence is leaving the temple. He testifies to what the nation leaders are doing in secret. They thought God didn't know. He witnesses the idolatry taking place among the leaders in Jerusalem. And as a result, the presence of God leaves the temple of God. 8 to 11 chapters in Ezekiel, how the presence of God left Solomon's temple because of the sins taking place. Ezekiel mentions that the glory of the Lord departed from between the cherubim. During the six years of Jeconiah's exile, which happens to be 593 B.C., from that moment forward, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't matter. Once the presence of God leaves the Ark of the Covenant, it's just an old box. No power, nothing in it, who cares? If God's not above it, who cares about an old coffin that just witnesses to our failures? Which means that from the time the exiles returned, now this is something many people don't know. When they rebuilt the temple, Nehemiah, and they rebuilt the temple, remember, and, and the one that we saw where Jesus, the temple there, there's no Ark of the Covenant there. The old one's gone, and they didn't rebuild one. They couldn't recreate it when you think about it. They couldn't recreate the table that, that God etched on stone. They couldn't go get another Aaron's rod. And they certainly couldn't go collect manna anywhere. There's no way for them to recreate this Ark of the Covenant once it was lost or gone or whatever happened to it. And since the Ark no longer represented God's dwelling place, it really wasn't necessary to create it. Jeremiah said this, In those days, declares the Lord, they shall no more say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. So Herod's temple, the temple in Jesus' day, did not have the Ark of the Covenant in it. When you see the artists that show the veil being torn, and you look through and you see the Ark, they don't know what they're talking about. It wasn't there. The only thing there was a rock where the Ark used to be. God told us this Ark would one day become unimportant. Because he wouldn't dwell in the Ark with his children, and the Millennial Kingdom will come. Jeremiah 3, 17, at that time, Jerusalem will be called the throne of God, and all the nations will gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. They shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. So yeah, it would be a really neat kind of historical find, I guess. But we have to remember that it's just wood and gold, no supernatural powers. God's presence was what made the ark unique. It's just a box now, a coffin, and it's going to remain that way. The ark only matters to those who doubt its existence. Those still trying to prove God. Those who think they just need one more piece of evidence. So let's leave the ark and focus on the bigger picture of the temple. All the direction of flow in the tabernacle that we've been studying has gone from the outer gate to the altar, to the laver, to the holy place, to the holy holes. It goes from out to in. You decide to enter the gate. You walk by the brazen altar where you once again participate in the death and the shedding of innocent blood for your sins. You're moved by the Spirit of God to the laver where you learn God's truth and you and everyone else prepare to enter into the holy place through confession and forgiveness. And You walk in the holy place and you're illuminated by the light of God. You're in the holiest place. You're, you're in the place where Jesus abides. You're in that place where you, you've gone spiritually to a new place. Every day, innocent blood is brought from the bronze altar and sprinkled in two places. First, on the front of the altar of incense, and second, on the horns of the altar of incense. Every day. Every day, people would slaughter animals, and we've talked about how many, and then the priest would go into the holy place, and he'd sprinkle blood on the altar of incense, on the horns, every day. More people, more blood, every day. Tomorrow, same thing, more blood. 
Each day, the sins of the people would just build up on the altar of incense. By the end of the year, this thing is just like full of blood from the year. It's like all your sins have just been brought to almost the holy place, to, to right there in front of the veil, to the altar of incense. All your sins, all the blood for all your sins has just been piling up there all year long. But one day each year, one very special day, something different happens. Eventually, all these sins have been allowed to pile up in front of God, and they need to be taken away. We have to get rid of the impact of our accumulated sin. So one day each year, a day called Yom Kippur, or the High Holy Day, or the Day of Atonement, the High Holy Day, let's read about it. Leviticus 16. I'm just going to hit the details. Um, there's a lot here, and I encourage you to go back to Leviticus 16 when we're done and read it. But I just want to show you something here. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses. Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat is on the ark so that he may not die. In other words, don't tell Aaron to walk in here. He'll die. He's the high priest. He'll still die. But in this way shall he come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. What's the difference? Okay, well, a burnt offering is more of a generic offering for our sins. We're not being very specific. We just know we're sinners and we're offering an animal up to God as a burnt offering. The entire animal is burned, consumed on the altar. It's a general kind of cover all sins kind of offering. A sin offering is the one that we're more familiar with. The blood of the animal is taken somewhere to atone for sin, a specific sin, okay? So that's the difference. He shall put on the holy linen coat, linen undergarments. He'll offer a bull as a sin offering for himself. He'll take two goats. He'll put them before the entrance of the tent. He'll cast lots over the goats. One goat gets to live. One goat doesn't. He'll present the goat as a sin offering. He'll present the bull as a sin offering for himself. He'll make atonement for himself. He'll take the censer of coals of the fire before the altar. He'll put incense before the Lord. A cloud will cover the mercy seat so that he does not die. And he'll take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And he'll sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. He'll kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. He'll essentially do the same thing. And when he's made atonement for the holy place, He'll present the live goat. He'll take both his hands, put it on the head of the live goat, place the sins of Israel on it, and he'll send it away into the wilderness. He'll come into the tent of meetings. He'll take off linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place, and he'll leave them there. And God says, this will be a statute to you forever. He will make atonement for the sins. He'll carry them away. So basically what's happening is, Two goats are brought. One we know as the scapegoat. In the Bible it's called Azazel, which is basically means scapegoat. One is tied to the bronze altar, the other is killed. The blood of the innocent dead goat goes to the holy place in the tabernacle. But what's weird here is we do something different. One day a year everything changes. The flow changes. You see, all year long the animal is sacrificed. The blood is brought into the holy place. It's put on the altar of incense. One day a year, God says, that's not how we're going to do it. We're going to take the blood. We're going to start in the holy place. We're going to sprinkle blood in the holy of holies on the mercy seat. And, and then we're going to come back out. We're going to sprinkle it at the base of the mercy seat. And then we're going to come back out. We're going to sprinkle it on the uh, altar of incense, on the horns of the altar of incense. We're going to come back. We're going to sprinkle it on the brazen altar. And then we're going to take the sins and we're going to put them on a goat and we're going to send them away. The flow is completely reversed on this one day. It is literally a cleansing of the sins of the people. All the sins have accumulated at the altar of incense all year long, and one day a year, God says, okay, let's get those sins out of here. And he puts them on the goat, and he sends them away. It is the blood that does that. 
The first time blood is sprinkled on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, then in front of the Ark, then on the horns of the altar of incense, then on the front of the altar of incense. Then he goes outside, he sprinkles it on the brazen altar, then on the horns of the brazen altar, and one day a year, cleansing flow goes from God to man. God had directed a reversal of flow for this one special day each year. The scapegoat has taken out the eastern gate, and he's let loose into the western wilderness. Carry away the sins. What it meant to them was, if the holiest man walked into the holiest place with atonement for sin, and he walked back out, that meant God had accepted what he'd offered him. To the Jewish person, that's huge. It means my sins for this year have been forgiven. My name is still written in the book of life. They had this concern, a real concern, that that it's possible their sins had been so bad that year that God would not forgive them. I mean, remember, they know they're rebellious, right? I mean, we go through this story. These people that are moving the ark, they're rebelling against God all the time. They know how heavy their sins are. They know what the weight is. So when that holy priest goes into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, they're all outside holding their breath. Is he going to come back out? Our sins are big. Is God going to still forgive them? Have we gone too far? Will God forgive my sins? Will I be written in the book of life this year? Or is this the end of us? So when he went into the holy place, it it was huge. They waited. The only thing I can describe it, it's like, you know when the astronauts go and there's that moment where they re-enter and you don't hear from them and everybody's just kind of waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and are they going to make it? Did they get through? And then all of a sudden you hear them and it's like this relief. That's the day of atonement for Jewish people. And also, don't miss the symbolism. Something very interesting. After he makes atonement for the sins of the people, he goes back into the holiest place, and what the Bible says is he leaves his linen garments there. And then he comes out of that place for the atonement and freedom of the world. It's a parallel to Jesus' garments being left where he was buried when he comes out for the atonement of the world. Everything is symbolic. The fear was that if God didn't accept, if he didn't accept it, then then the high priest could die in the holy place and none of them would survive because their names would not be in the book of life. If God accepted their payment and the high priest lived, the scapegoat took it away. Took it away to the east, out the eastern gate, to wander in the western wilderness. You've heard that before, right? Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. The goats carry away our sins. This year, in this moment. For this moment, we're all clean. Oops, we're not clean anymore. Somebody just sinned. It lasted for a little while. But as soon as there's another sin, guess what? The process has to start over again. An animal has to die, innocent blood has to be shed, it's got to be sprinkled on the altar of incense. We start accumulating our sins for the next year, and we just keep doing it over and over and over. It's really fruitless when you think about it. It's temporary. But the overall plan's not temporary. This whole thing is, of course, a picture of Jesus. All the sins of man have piled up through human history, including the ones not yet committed Jesus goes into the Holy of Holies, the holy place, takes all those sins, becomes the innocent scapegoat. The sins of the people are placed on him at the altar or cross. His blood covers the altar. His blood is at the base of it, and he's carried away outside the city to die for the sins of the people. It's an incredible picture of God saying once and for all, I'm carrying away the sins of mankind and putting them on Jesus. He was taken out of the city and he died. And then people waited three days. 
just like they waited for the high priest to come out of the holy place. And then, yes, Jesus erupts. He comes out at resurrection. God has accepted the payment of our sins forever. We can be free because we have faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross. No more need for daily sacrifices. No more need. We just have to trust that Jesus was the final lamb of God, the final sacrifice, and that God accepted his payment for everyone. Everyone in the world has been paid. Their sins have been paid by the lamb of God. That's what resurrection means. Now, another big picture I want you to see when you think about the tabernacle is I want you to go back to Mount Sinai. God speaking to Moses, and he begins to compare his love for the Israelites like a spouse's love for their spouse. God says, Moses, I want to take you, Israel, to be my wife. I want to be in a covenant with you. I want to be in a covenant relationship with you. I'm not just here to experience. I'm not here just to dwell. I'm actually here to be with you. Some months ago, I preached about Jewish weddings and the covenant that was established. If you remember the Jewish wedding, they got married. They made their vows to God under a canopy. Remember the covenant or marriage vows. Remember the mikvah. They, remember the bride had to be cleansed first. The washing of Israel before it all happened. When you look at a Jewish wedding, you have the tabernacle. There's a tent, a covenant, a layer of cleansing, fine white linens of the purity of the bride. You see, the marriage covenant, like all covenants in the Bible, is a blood covenant. It's made with words, but the promise is in blood. Part of the Jewish wedding, of the Orthodox Jewish wedding, including the Jewish wedding today, is one of the most important things for a bride to present to her husband is her purity. It was important to them, very important. In fact... They wanted to make sure that the first sexual experience that woman had was with her new husband. If not, there was enormous shame on the woman and on her father. So important it was that they had to preserve evidence of her virginity as part of the wedding ceremony. Okay, now we think this is odd. This is very normal for them. Basically what would happen was they, they would get married. They would go to a place... The outer court of this place was like a living room. That's where everybody's hanging out. That's where everybody's doing their thing. It's a wedding ceremony, right? That's where you had your guests. That's where you experienced everybody. That's where you had fellowship with one another. That's where you did life together. But all Jewish weddings had a bridal chamber. A place for the husband and wife to get away from the guests and spend time with their family. So the first part of the wedding was they, they would make their vows, they would get married, everybody would go out and celebrate, and then the family with the bride and the husband would go into a place for them. They would hang out, they would celebrate. They also had a private part of the bridal chamber. It's actually behind a sheet or a veil. And that is the place where intimacy would occur for the first time, and the blood evidence of the bride's purity would be revealed. It's weird to us today, but it was absolutely accepted and expected and demanded that the marriage be consummated during the marriage ceremony. It was critical that there be evidence that the bride was pure, reflected on the bride and the family. But the idea of an inner holy place, a private place for just the bride and groom is not foreign to us. I very much remember the sanctity of my mom and dad's bedroom. You needed permission to go in there. It was their escape. It was the place where they could be a couple, where they could share their love and intimacy together and be alone together. It was not foreign to us. God said, look, build me a sanctuary. And then you expect him to say, and I will live in it, right? Build me a sanctuary and I'll live in it. That's not what he says. He says, build me a sanctuary and I will live among you. In the Greek, it's often translated, build me a sanctuary and I will live in you. 
God had the idea in his mind of a very intimate relationship with us. We abide in Christ. We strengthen our relationship with him. We're shaped and molded to be like him. We belong with him. That's where we find true intimacy with Christ. We go to the holy place. We go to the holiest place. We're expected to go there every day. When we get on our knees and pray, we're modeling the tabernacle. We're moving ourselves from our sinful state. We're going to the labor. We're cleaning our hands. We're cleaning our feet. We're making sure we're clean. We get down on our knees. We abide in the presence of God. We just sit in his presence. We feel his love. It feels like coming home is what it feels like. It's there that we begin to change. Our desires change. Our temptations seem to go away because he's making us into a new person. We are spending part of our day literally with Jesus in the holy place. And God says, look, I actually expect you to be there every day. I'm waiting for you. Where have you been? How do we have a covenant marriage relationship? How how can we be in this if you're never home? I'm waiting for you to be in the holy place with me now and today. Can you imagine a marriage without a place of intimacy, without communication, without talking? Neither can God. Spiritually, for those of us who trust Jesus, he's waiting for us to abide with him every day. That's where he is, so the question for us is, where are we? Let me give you another image. Instead of the wedding ceremony, let's go back to Mount Sinai. You remember the power of God, the smoke, the cloud, the glory, the shaking of the ground? How are we going to take that with us, Moses had to ask. Think about what all the Israelites must have felt in that moment. God's power, majesty, glory revealed to them on top of the mountain. They had to prepare for three days just to be able to look at it. And then it seems they forgot it almost instantly. And that's when God said, okay, let's build a tabernacle. Let's create a portable Mount Sinai that you can take with you. At the foot of Mount Sinai, they built an altar. Before they could go up a little further, they had to wash. When they got to Mount Sinai, there was a burning bush. There was evidence of the the lampstand of God. Front and center, there's a cloud, a cloud of incense, God's presence up on top of the hill. As we go further, we see that God has indeed come down and he speaks to Moses. God said to them, look, wherever you go, wherever you experience, I'm going to go with you. Everything that we did on Mount Sinai, Moses, we're going to do together. It's interesting that once the tabernacle was built, Moses never went back up on Mount Sinai again. He had no reason to. God was dwelling with him in the tabernacle. We don't even know where that mountain is anymore. Who cares? God doesn't live there anymore. It's just like the ark. Don't need to know that it exists. God said it was, and that's enough for me. I believe that as long as we need to prove God and what he's already told us, We'll never find it because he tells us to walk by faith. God left Mount Sinai and entered the tabernacle. It's critical to them. It was critical to us. As we go through our day, we need to be able to take the intimacy of God with us. If we fail to spend time in the holy place with God, then we lose the fire that was on Mount Sinai. Without intimacy, without time alone with God, we grow cold our relationship with God becomes stale and stagnant. We can't remember the last time we felt loved by God or the last time that we felt his presence or the last time we just fell down on our face. I believe that in a spiritual sense, many believers have made vows to Jesus but haven't spent much time in the intimate place with him. They've been baptized with water, they're saved. They have the Holy Spirit in them. They are, however, missing out on the level of intimacy that Jesus planned for all of us. They're living a good life, good spiritual life with Jesus. They're abiding with Christ once in a while in the holy place. But Jesus calls us to deeper places. 
He wants his believers not living in the holy place, but communing with him in the holiest place. We just sang, but you call us deeper still. What does that mean? It means spiritually he doesn't leave us where we are. He's always calling us to deeper places. It's a place where we go spiritually, a place where things of God happen, a place where one becomes in the presence of the Trinity. In this intimate place, the Holy Spirit is free to connect the Spirit in us with God. It's a place in our prayer life where we leave the world behind. I want to explain this to you because it's so important. Many people say, I never felt the deeper things of God. I never feel God's presence. I never feel what I, other people talk about being in this incredible place with God and feeling spiritual. I don't feel that. Okay. He promises it, so you must not be abiding. Abiding. Spending time with God with the intent of staying. Okay. It's a deeper place spiritually. It's a place where you're praying and you're, you're talking to God and you're doing all the normal prayers and all of a sudden you begin to realize that something's happening. Something deeper is happening. It's, it's, it's almost like you don't have words anymore. You're, you're not praying with words anymore. You're just there and you're, you're there and you begin to feel the presence of God and you feel overwhelmed with his love and you, and you just stay in that place and you want to hold on to it forever. And there's not a lot of words going back and forth. It's just a presence and a being. And you know that what's happening is spiritual, not physical. You know that what's happening is not of you. You've entered into a holy place where spiritual things happen with a holy God. It's almost too great to even try to express to people. It's a place of peace and acceptance and overwhelming love. A place where we lose track of time. It's the closest thing we have on earth to heaven itself. It's a taste of what we're going to have throughout all of eternity. And I believe that most who enter into the Holy of Holies in their relationship with Jesus describe that experience as just feeling a flood of the Holy Spirit. Some will call it a baptism of the Spirit. Some will call it an anointing. Some will call it being filled up today. They'll have all kinds of names for it. But what they're saying is, I went in the presence of God, and now I'm so much spiritually stronger than I was before because something happened to me. I didn't do anything. Something happened to me. I surrendered and the presence of God showed up in my life and I can't wait to go back there again. We get lost in things. Well, is that baptism of the Spirit? What really? It doesn't matter. It's an anointing. It's the feeling of the presence of God in your life. Thank God for that. Some people call it ridiculous. God called it coming home. Dwelling with him. Spiritual children in love with their spiritual father dwelling together without anything holding them back. You see, too often we think if we go to a spiritual place with God that what happens there needs to be logical. No, it needs to be spiritual. When we pray in the Spirit, we're allowing our minds to get out of the way and let the Spirit in us commune with God. We get to a point where we just let go and let God do whatever He wants to do. You see, for the high priest entering the Holy of Holies, think about this. The high priest is entering the Holy of Holies. What does he think is going to happen there? Something spiritual is about to happen. I'm about to go in the middle of the cherubim. God's presence is going to be there. Whatever happens when I go behind this veil, it's going to be wild and crazy spiritual. I don't think he goes in there going, now this is going to be a logical explanation of all the things of God. No. No. He doesn't have a clue what's going to happen because whatever happens behind that veil is God's stuff, not people's stuff. Nothing's changed. It's the same for us. The veil was torn so believers could experience the same intimacy that Moses and the high priest had. Let me just ask you this. Is your quiet time with God that kind of experience? Because he expected it to be. Let me give you another image. I want to read to you some passages. Exodus 25, 1. The Lord said to Moses. Exodus 30, 11. The Lord said to Moses. 
Exodus 30, 17, the Lord said to Moses, Exodus 30, 22, the Lord said to Moses, verse 34, the Lord said to Moses, 31, 1, the Lord said to Moses, and 31, 12, the Lord said to Moses. What do they have in common? Right, the Lord said to Moses. This is the, this is the dialogue of God telling him how to build the temple. The Lord said to Moses, go get acacia wood, go get blah, blah. The Lord said to Moses, build me an ark. The Lord said to Moses, okay. Do you notice how many times? Seven. Hmm. Number of perfection and completion, right? Can you think of another thing that God did where he spoke seven times and things got built? Creation, right? Do you remember what the seventh word he said about creation was on the seventh? Yeah, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he'd done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he'd done. And he blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy because God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. You want to guess what the seventh thing is in the building of the tabernacle? When God said to Moses, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbath. For this is a sign between you and me and you throughout your generations that you will know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You will keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Now, God's about to connect some dots here in case you haven't noticed. Why did God create the earth and create us in the first place? He didn't have to, right? He's God. He could have done whatever he wanted. But for some reason, he built the universe, and he built the earth, and he made it perfect for humans to exist. Why? Because he loves us, and he wants to dwell with us. I need to create a place, God says, where I can dwell. Let me show you the universe. I made it for you. I created it. I didn't ask you about it. I didn't tell you to do it. You didn't do any of it. I did it. Here it is. Go fill it. It's all yours. God's original tabernacle was the earth and his creation, the place where he will dwell. Everything about him is reflected in creation. Just like we looked at the tabernacle and we said, well, gold, that's God's glory. And we looked, oh, uh, silver, that, that's his redemption. You could see God in the building of the tabernacle. You can see God in the building of creation, his majesty, his complexity. His simplicity, his order, his structure, his provision, his glory. It's a place where God could dwell with men. In fact, that's exactly what he did with Adam and Eve. God's presence was everywhere. Everything was good. The entire universe was his tabernacle. His dwelling place with man. The psalmist understood this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It is rising from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. God has set a tent for the sun. Comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Look at the command God gave to Adam and Eve. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds. God told Adam and Eve, look, I've created all this place. It's incredible. I did amazing things. Go explore it and fill it up. But they failed. Well, they filled it up all right. They filled it up with sin and rebellion. They filled it up. They filled it up with an entire universe devoted to the rejection of God. So the earth could no longer be the dwelling place of God, even though he created it. 
That's what John says. Even though he created it, the world didn't recognize him. Yeah, okay. So, he has to leave. And when he leaves, he says, you know what? I need to develop a new dwelling place. I've got to find another place where I can dwell with these sinful people. Thus comes the tabernacle. The Jews would have seen this parallel. Seven days he spoke something, seven days he spoke something. The last day, the Sabbath, God is making a new creation. The tabernacle is his new creation, just like the earth was his original creation. And it's created for the same reason. God wants to dwell with us. So God came down again and he said this, and don't miss this, because he does it differently this time. He says, look, this time you make the space and I'll fill it. See, the first time I made the space, you didn't fill it. We're not doing that again. This time, you create the space. And when you create the space, I'll come dwell with you. It was easy for God to create the universe, relatively. Seven times he spoke. Seven times things happened. Let there be. Much harder for man to make a place for God. Fifty chapters it takes. God gave the blueprint to Moses. He said, here's a new creation, a temporary tent. It's going to foreshadow the final one to come. So with great effort, God's direction, God's provision, they finished building the tabernacle, his dwelling place. And when they finished building the space, then God filled it. Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They come out of the temple, they look back, and the glory of God has fallen all over the place. Fire from above. And all they could do is fall on their face. Years later, God would say, let's build another space and I'll fill it. And he takes him to the temple in Jerusalem. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple just like it had for the tabernacle. And the priest could not enter the house of God because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the people saw the fire came down and glory of the Lord, they bowed down on their faces and hit the pavement and worshiped God and gave thanks to the Lord saying, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. God is filling the temple just like he filled the tabernacle. God is good. He is going to dwell with us. He does want to be with us. And all they could do is fall on their face. He is good. Now notice, when they experienced the presence of God, they didn't fall on their face and go, oh, he's going to condemn us. Oh, he's going he's to hurt us. He's going to do something. No, they were overwhelmed with his goodness. They felt his goodness. They felt who he was, his love for them. He dropped a love bomb on them, and they knew it. Years later, another day, at that very same temple, God had another space to fill. You create the space, I'll come fill it. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. In other sermons, I've talked about why I believe this moment occurred at the Temple Mount and not at the upper room. The Spirit of God over them, just like the fire, the Spirit of God had been over the temple and the tabernacle. And from that ball, fire came out and rested on 120 apostles and disciples. It was like God saying, okay, I just chose my new place to dwell, and guess what? It's you. Our fathers had the tent of a witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out from before our fathers. And it was until the day of David when God found favor in the sight of God 
and developed a dwelling place. Solomon built a house for him, and yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. Here's what he's saying. The presence of God was on Mount Sinai. The presence of God moved to the tabernacle. The presence of God moved from the tabernacle to the temple. The presence of God moved from the temple to Jesus walking on earth as God. Then it moved from there to the Holy Spirit falling on us. And now the same fire, power, and dwelling of God that was at Mount Sinai is in you. That's the point. Do you not know that you're God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. From the garden, to Mount Sinai, to the tabernacle, to the temple, to Jesus, to you and me. Spaces created from the beginning of mankind. Spaces that God says, if you will create them, I will fill them. Every time man has created space for God, God has filled it. There's only one reason why God does not dwell with somebody. They never made space. Exodus 25, 8, and let them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell in their midst. What if Moses and the Israelites had not built the tabernacle? The only way God doesn't dwell with you in the way we've described is if you refuse to create space for him. Are you experiencing the presence of God in your life every day? Are you growing in deeper understanding of who he is and who you are? Are you abiding in that private place of his love where all you can do is fall on your face? Are you in the presence of every God every day, every day you're with God? And all you want to do is shout out, he is good. He's good. If that doesn't describe your spiritual walk, because that's supposed to be the norm for us. If that's not you, let me share with you a sobering truth. If you have no space for God, he has no place with you. If you haven't created space for God in your life, he won't fill it. He says it this way, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't prioritize your life, God says, to make space for me. If you don't build space for me in your life, you will never feel me dwelling with you. It will not happen. We tried it that way and it didn't work. Remember, we tried the idea that I would build it and you would fill it. It didn't work. So is there space for God in your family? Not just your devotions, praying and Bible reading. Is there really space for God to work? Is there space every day in everything you do for God? In your school, in your church, in your heart? God says, look, I want to dwell with you. I want to experience what you experience. I want to be with you. I had to leave because of sin, so we built a portable tabernacle. And now we've built a portable Holy Spirit that's inside of you. I'm with you everywhere you go. I just want you to know it. And I want you to live like it. And I want you to experience it. When people say they're filled with more of the Holy Spirit, they didn't get more, they just realized more. They always had it. Those who create space for God every day, they experience the filling of His Spirit. How do you and I approach God in our daily quiet time? Well, we've talked about it. You spiritually walk through the tabernacle. You're just aware of the price that was paid. You're aware that you need to be cleansed. You're aware that you're in the presence of Jesus and you're asking him to take you to deeper places. Every day in your quiet time, you enter into the presence of God and it's like coming home. You're right where you're created to be. You're a spiritual being. I can't explain it any other way, but it's like when you pull back that that door and you go into the place where Jesus is, it's just like home. Everything's okay. 
I can be who I am. I'm fully known. He fully knows me. I've confessed my sins. I'm not hiding anything. I'm just here. And I'm just home. And you feel his incredible love. And you feel his incredible acceptance. And you feel just how much he cares about you. And it's not about words. It's about being. You don't have words anymore. You left those out at the laver when you were confessing your sins. Now you're just in the presence of Jesus. And all you can do is say, he's good. He's just really good. And I belong. And I finally feel like I'm home. He literally changes who you are. You find yourself no longer tempted by the things of the world because you've experienced the things of God. You leave your quiet place every day literally glowing because you've been in His presence. Nothing can touch you now. And you know you'll be back there again soon because you can't help it. You don't want to do anything that keeps you from the intimacy that you have for tomorrow's visit. So you try to stay as clean as you can. You try to honor God every way you can because you know tomorrow you're going back to the same place. Or maybe later today. The presence of God is like a drug. When you experience it, all you want is more. You will do anything to get back into that place again. The presence of God is the greatest addiction on the human planet. You crave it. You can't get enough of it. You'll give anything for it. You'll come back for it over and over again. You can't live without it. Once you've experienced the intimacy of God, nothing else matters. As soon as you're apart, you want to go back. It consumes your thought. It drives your intentions. It defines everything around you and about you. You might as well face it. You're addicted to love. He's good. You're good. Everything is right. You're exactly where you were created to be. The place you were created to be in the presence of the one who created you to be. It's when you spiritually go to the place with God that you find your purpose and your meaning and you're going home. And you know when you arrive that you're home. You have spiritually come home. It's a shadow of the final dwelling place that we'll have with God. It's a taste of his goodness. It's the closest thing we have as human beings to experience the holiness of God in heaven. You and I were created with an addiction. And we've been chasing things our whole life. False idols, drugs, alcohol, pride, lust, greed, envy, arrogance. You pick it, we've chased it. We are great at being addictive. Problem is we've been addicted to the wrong thing. I'm giving you total and free permission to be addicted to Jesus Christ. If you want to be free at last, if you want to experience the rest of your human life the way God planned for his children, his believers to live, then create space in your life so he can actually fill it. Create a full force, unstoppable addiction to Jesus Christ. You are God's temple. There's nowhere else on earth for him to dwell. His presence, his fire left the throne in heaven, fell on Mount Sinai, led them through the night, fell on the tabernacle, fell on the temple, walked on earth, fell at Pentecost, and now it's smacked slab dab right into you and me. How dare we tell him we don't have time for him? How dare we fail to create space in our life for him to fill? If you build it, he will come. You create a sanctuary, God says, and I'll dwell with you. We're going to spend a few moments praying and thinking and confessing and repenting, and the altar's open, and I think God just wants to work on the heart of remnant. Maybe you need to surrender and create space for God in your life for the very first time. Maybe you need to admit that you just need to come home, that your life is just not what you thought it would be, and you don't really understand it all, but you know that the answer is in Jesus, and you just want to take that next step. Maybe your surrender to God hasn't happened for a very long time. You've walked with God. You've sort of kicked around the edges of the tent and the tabernacle, but you've never really gone in and surrendered yourself and sat in his presence. And this experience I'm describing of being in the presence of God is something that's really foreign to you, and you may have been following God forever. 
but I think now's the time to come home. The altar's going to be open. If you want to pray by yourself, just stay down at the altar and pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, just lift your hand up and somebody will join you. God's been waiting for you for a long time in the holy place at home, right where you belong. And I believe this morning he's calling you home. Let's pray. God, you've gone to great extremes to dwell with us. Create the space, you said, and I'll fill it. If we're not experiencing you, God, we haven't created the space for you. So God, forgive us when our busyness is the excuse we use for not being in your presence. Forgive us when we say we don't understand enough to be in your presence. Forgive us, God, when we make any of thousands of excuses for why today there was no time for you and why there hasn't been time for you day after day, week after week, month after month, and yet we still wonder why we don't feel close to you. No covenant relationship works unless there's intimacy. Draw us deeper, God. Please don't leave us where we are. Holy Spirit, convict in this room where you need to convict. For people who are outside the tent that don't know Jesus at all, would you just flood them with your love and presence? Help them to understand that they have to give up. They have to surrender to Jesus, and they've got to accept the blood that Jesus offered on the cross so that they too can enter into your presence. For those who've walked with you and have been ignoring you, they need to pray for forgiveness. They need to repent, turn around, and begin to give you time and space. For those who've doubted that you want to take them deeper, it's a sin that needs to be confessed. You always want to take us deeper than where we've been. God, please allow us when we leave this room to be completely, totally, and absolutely addicted to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.